In this unit, we're going to unlearn two myths about multinational corporations. Maybe these aren't myths that you yourself believe, but still it might be useful to set out more explicitly exactly why they're wrong. Sometimes it's argued that the very largest multinational corporations are much bigger than countries. Let's see how this argument goes. Well, if we take the company of Apple, right now, as of mid-2012, their market capitalization is somewhat over... $500 billion, which of course is a very large sum. Apple is a large company, and right now they're the largest company in the United States and the largest real private sector company in the world. But here's where the mistake comes in. You could take some countries that have GDPs of at or a bit below $500 billion, and those countries would include Poland, Belgium, Sweden, Switzerland, and people are sometimes tempted to conclude that Apple, as an economic entity, is larger or more important than those countries because the market capitalization of Apple, somewhat over $500 billion, is greater than a lot of those GDPs. But that is a mistake. It's a mistake because it's confusing stocks and flows. GDP is essentially a flow. It's the value of goods and services produced in a year in a given country. So very roughly you can think of GDP as something happening at a particular point in time, a stream of goods and services. Capitalization of a company is a stock. It's the expectations about the total amount of value embedded in that country across many future years. So if Apple has a market capitalization of about $500 billion, well, that's the stock. The flow of sales through Apple in, say, 2011 that was a little bit over $100 billion. That's still very large, but you can see that for Apple, the flow is much less than the stock, just as in this picture, the flow of water is much less than the body of water, which you can think of as the stock. So if you're comparing the capitalization of a company to the GDP of a country, you are, in essence, confusing stocks and flows. It should not come as a surprise that in many instances the stock will be measured as larger than the flow, but that doesn't mean that Apple as an economic entity is more important than, say, Belgium or Sweden. Our second issue is quite distinct. This comes up when you find individuals in very poor countries who are working in the factories of multinationals. It may be the case that many of these individuals are paid no more than a few dollars a day. Observers look at these situations, and very frequently they call it exploitation, that you could have a multinational company which is so wealthy and perhaps so profitable, and it's paying its workers such small amounts. Now, this is very often a moral argument, and economics per se cannot evaluate moral arguments, whether they're right or wrong. But nonetheless, understanding the world through an economic lens can help you frame moral arguments in different ways. So the original view was that the multinational corporation is exploiting the poor worker by paying that worker just a few dollars a day. An alternative view, suggested by economic reasoning, is to wonder if there is exploitation in this situation, maybe the problem isn't the company paying the worker, but perhaps the problem is that there aren't more companies paying the workers. Let's look at this in more detail. If you look at the nation of Singapore, in the 1960s, Singapore was not a wealthy place. Its workers were paid very small sums of money, and sometimes the workers were paid small sums of money by multinational corporations. Nonetheless, the leadership of Singapore decided that it would open up the country to foreign investment and protect the rights of foreign investors and create a favorable tax and regulatory environment, and over the next few decades, there was a lot more foreign investment in Singapore. What happened to all that exploitation? Well, it went away. Today, Singapore is an extremely wealthy place, and in fact, in terms of per capita income, Singapore is now wealthier than the United States. Looking at Singapore helps us shift our perspective. The exploitation problem is not the foreign investors you have. If there is an exploitation problem, you can think of it in terms of the foreign investors you do not have. Or let's look at an area where multinational investors have gone away. In the country of Haiti, there is a town, Jeremy, on this part uh, right near the water on the northern coast. And in former times, Jeremy was well known for attracting a lot of foreign investment and some factories run by multinationals, including Walt Disney. 
These factories paid low wages, but still, an awful lot of Haitians were quite happy to work there because it was higher wages than they could earn on their own. Unfortunately, over time, most of these factories went away. The Haitians had a good reputation as workers, but there were problems with the electricity, problems with political order, problems with corruption at the port, and in general, Haiti, over considerable periods of time, was becoming a poorer country and a less well-run country. So the multinationals leave this part of Haiti, and over time, what can we say? Well, maybe you could say the exploitation went away, but is that really the correct way to think about it? The developmental path of Jeremy would have been much brighter if over the last few decades it had been gaining multinational investors rather than losing them.